I'm back, bitches. Cardi B, I'm back, bitches. I don't want to hear I'm acting different. What's another one? Ooh. And it's been a while since I could record a podcast episode. And it's been a while since I first saw you. Yep, that's right. I'm back. Woo! Hang on to your husbands, girls. <laughs> if you're watching this on YouTube, what's up? You already know me, Jangs from Queers and Steers. Hi, how are ya? If you are listening to the podcast only, this might seem a little different. So this is a complete rebrand for me. If you are here on the podcast, this used to be Dual Emergence, which was a podcast with my homie Byron. When I was living in Los Angeles, we had a podcast together. We, we released a few episodes, but now I live in Atlanta, Georgia. And the Queers and Steers brand has been my longest running media platform on YouTube. And for me, especially since I've relocated and my life is very different now, I thought it would be a good idea to sort of consolidate all of these pieces together under the brand name Queers and Steers. So if you're listening on podcasts and you're opening up the app and you see Queers and Steers instead of Dual Emergence, that is why you are getting me full time. It's really great to be back. I think the last time I released a podcast was two years ago. I think it was August of 2022. So it feels good to be back. I now have the emotional bandwidth to be here. I really want to start doing this full time and more consistently. So if you are a podcast subscriber, thank you for being subscribed and thank you for your patience and for sticking with me. This podcast under the dual emergence name has five star rating. So really appreciate that. Uh, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you are not subscribed, it's queers and steers. That's Q U E E R S A N D S T E E R S on YouTube. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you listen to podcasts, definitely check me out on Apple podcasts or Spotify under queers and steers under dual emergence we did a peak and a pit. We always started every episode with a high and a low for the week. I'm gonna eventually get back to that, but I thought since I'm rebranding myself, I thought it would be a really good idea for me to just reintroduce myself to you. So whether you're watching on YouTube or you're listening on the podcast, maybe this is your first time listening, I wanted to reintroduce myself so you know who I am and what I stand for. So my name is Jenks. I was born in Indiana in 1989. I'm a 35 year old bae. After college, I moved to Chicago. So I lived in Chicago for seven years, got super sick and tired of the cold, moved to Los Angeles, lived there for five years. I'm about to sneeze. Okay, it's gone. And then after Los Angeles, I moved to Atlanta. So I've been in Atlanta for just a little over a year, completely different places. If you're ever interested about hearing about why I moved and what the places are like, let me know if that's something you'd be interested in. I really, really, really wanna make a video about LA as a whole, because not only my time there, but just I think, uh, perception of Los Angeles as a place. Uh, there's definitely a reason why I moved out of LA. So if you're ever interested in hearing that, let me know and I'll make a, an entire episode about that. It's funny, so queers and steers, obviously queers and steers, I love play on words. I love alliteration, I love rhyming. Steers is like steering a car. So my YouTube channel is automotive and electric vehicle focused. However, I don't have a press clearance. I don't even know how that works. I feel like a lot of people in the automotive journalism space have connections already, which enables them to get press cars and to do long-term reviews and stuff like that. So I would still really love to do that full-time in some capacity. I'm confident that someday I will get there. It just takes time and patience. But recently I released, uh, I drive the Kia EV9 electric SUV and I released a video reviewing that car. And in the beginning, I was like, so imagine this, you are a black single gay man living in Atlanta and one of the comments in the video, and you know, there are trolls everywhere, but one of the comments was like, man, everyone thinks that they're black nowadays, da 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 da. And I just, I'm not gonna get into race today. I think that shit is really funny to me that like everyone's perception of who someone is is based on how they present themselves, which is like, again, I understand why that is, but if you didn't know, I am half black, biracial, also Jewish, pro human right, pro Palestinian, pro abolition, pro Sudan, pro Congo anti-Zionist, anti-imperialist, and if that is a concern for you listening or watching, this might not be the best place for you. Just gonna say that right now. The last thing I'll say about myself is I'm a tech nerd. I worked for a very prominent technology company for seven years. I'm not engineer level nerd, but when it comes to features of cell phones, tablets, computers, 
cars. I could tell you more about cars than probably like 98% of the people on this planet. Not how to like put shit together and do an oil, I can do an oil change, but like not about the engine and technical side of things, but when it comes to features and pricing, all of that, there's no one on YouTube that knows as much as me. The problem with being a tech nerd, however, is as you can see, like my, you can't see my MacBook Pro, but it's recording redundant audio over here. I've got the new M4 iPad Pro. I just got the new iPhone 16 Pro Max because I'm gonna be diving more into like video content, of course. And so I wanted to make sure that I had a good phone to use. And the problem with that is obviously considering everything that's going on with resource extraction in Congo, it's displacing millions of people. It's killing millions of people. It's really challenging to be pro-humanitarian, pro-indigenous, pro-black when you also consume digital devices that are like contributing to the displacement of millions of people. So I try to be as responsible as I can. Like this Apple Watch is four years old. Like I used to upgrade all of my devices every year because I worked for a technology company and it made sense for me to do so. However, now I really, really try to do it only when it's absolutely necessary. This iPad Pro that I have in front of me, the last time I bought an iPad was the first iPad Pro that came out ever, which was like, I'm gonna put the, the year on the screen here, um, but it was like at least a decade ago, <laughs> I wanna say. So um, I really needed this for my professional work and on the go. So I say all of this to say that you can be a tech nerd and be responsible. Like I'm not gonna fucking buy three iPhones and do a drop test or destroy them for views because that is waste and that is unnecessary to me. I try not to beat myself up about how I consume technology now. Enough about me. So historically speaking, when it came to previous podcast episodes, I would pick a bajillion topics and try to cover a bunch of them. I am very long winded and so I'm trying to avoid this podcast being over an hour long. I'm already at 10 minutes just talking about myself. This guy that I'm dating, <laughs> which is completely new for me. I've been single basically my entire fucking life, but I'm dating a real cutie and he is lovely. His advice was to pick somewhat of a cohesive single topic and then carry that through for the entire episode. So for today, I'm going to be talking politics, period, the end. Let me know in the comments of this YouTube video or feel free to email me, editor, at thesetstandard.com. You can also find me on Instagram at callmefag, that's C-A-L-L-M-E-F-A-G. Send me a DM and let me know what you're more curious or what you wanna hear about. Technology is a big one. Hollywood and pop culture is a big one. If you're not subscribed, like I said, get subscribed to YouTube, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. Let's talk about politics. I've historically voted Democrat completely across the board my entire life. I haven't been voting that long, I'm 35, so however long that is, uh, almost two decades now. Like I voted for Obama, I voted for Biden, and what I'm learning is, while I don't think Republicans or Donald Trump is any better. I think they both are terrible for different reasons. I can't in good faith continue to support candidates who are either anti-women's choice, anti-body autonomy, anti-black people, Republican side, but I also can't vote for gaslighting and progenocide, which is the Democratic side. So for the first time ever, I consider myself an independent. I am going to be voting for Jill Stein come election in November. I know a lot of people have thoughts about Jill Stein or have thoughts about not voting for the lesser of two evils, which is Kamala, which I'll get into later. And to be honest with you, I suspect that most of the people who are subscribed and listening are probably voting for Kamala. And that's cool, like I'm not here to judge you. I understand why that was me when I voted for Joe Biden four years ago. I was just like, oh, well, fuck Trump. Trump can't get into the office. He's gonna destroy everything. But now that's how I feel. I feel that about Trump, but I also feel that about what Democrats are doing to our nation currently. So I am voting for Jill Stein. She has stood on business the whole time. She's been pro reparations. She has been anti-war machine, anti-genocide. She's been pro-universal health care. There's just so much that she has supported throughout her entire political career that I stand with. And I will say she's still a career politician, even though she's grassroots, she's not getting nearly as much money as Kamala or Trump or any of the other two party system candidates. However, to me, she inspires hope. Her vice president, Butch Ware, is a black Muslim and he stands on business as well. I just think that that's like seeing them together and seeing them speak 
gives me hope that that's something that we could have. And even if they don't win this next election, which the likelihood of them actually winning is, is slim, which is why I think people say, well, if you vote third party, you're just giving your vote to Trump, which I think that is a, a silly way to look at things. I'm giving my vote to Jill and Butch because they stand for things that I believe in and that I think will carry us forward. If you want to vote for a warmonger, Kamala, um, shit, go talk to the non-voters. So I did this poll on my Instagram on August 28th asking, I said, no judgment, not even gonna respond to you, I'm just collecting some data. So I have a little over 3,500 followers and I believe, uh, I think it was like 250 something actually took this survey. So obviously people who follow me are probably, it's there's some bias there like, Obviously I am who I am, so you're really only getting the more left or liberal side of things, but this is still interesting data. So I said, who are you voting for in November? 25% said Jill Stein, which to me is incredible because if I had asked this survey four years ago, I would suspect that that would be less than 5%. And keep in mind, if the Green Party, which is Jill Stein's party, gets at least 5% of the vote, uh, the popular vote, they get a ton more, like they get more funding, they become like, actually nationally recognized as a party, which could help them get on the debate stage and just get more attention overall. So the fact that she got 25% of the left side of the vote is incredible to me. 52% uh, said Kamala Harris, 1% said Donald Trump, which means 23% said that they're not voting or they're gonna vote for someone else. I kind of put that in one category because Instagram doesn't let you put more than four options. I think that is very eye-opening. So I say this to say, the reason I wanted to pull that up is one, it's just interesting data, but I think, especially for a liberationist who believes that the only way forward is to break apart from the binary, which is Democratic and Republican, I would tell anyone who is voting for the lesser of two evils and can, trying to convince third party voters that they shouldn't vote for Jill because it's not worth it. Go focus on the 23% who's not voting. If you wanna to try to convince anyone to vote for the lesser of two evils, shit, go talk to the non-voters. I'm still gonna tell you if you're watching this and you're a non-voter or you're not committed, I'm not gonna tell you how to vote, but I wanna vote for what I feel is the way out of the binary, away from giving all of our money to a foreign country to bomb civilians repeatedly. To me, ending that cycle is voting for Jill and Butch because that has been their platform for decades. Speaking of bombing innocent civilians and children, I wanna talk about Israel. I went to Israel for birthright in 2016. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Jewish, so I wasn't raised Jewish and I don't practice. My mother, her entire family, so the white parent, they were all raised Jewish. And so when I was born, my mom didn't really identify or acknowledge, I didn't even know she was Jewish until I was much older. However, it was something, having grown up in a Pentecostal Christian household, I think the premise of being Jewish and even going on the birthright trip, which back then I didn't realize what it was about, I think there was excitement for me because that trip was exclusively queer, LGBTQIA, 2S+, Group. So I was like, fuck, I can go on this free trip to the motherland with a bunch of queers and like, it's a free trip, fuck it, I'm gonna go. I'm not gonna dive into the trip itself, but like, as you can imagine, there is a ton of propaganda during that trip. I actually have a screenshot from a, a homie who was on that trip with me. They were one of the only other like femme identifying, presenting people on the trip. Uh, so much so that our our guide at the time was like, you know, we're about to go toward Jerusalem, like it's old school. Depending on how you dress, like people might say shit to you, they might throw rocks at you, which is like fine. Um, well, it's not, I shouldn't say that it's fine, but it's like not surprising is what I mean to say. Um, but during a presentation in Tel Aviv, again, this is 2016, uh, we were by the stock exchange or by, you know, the financial district, whatever. And there was a presentation with a screenshot that was like, it's like Israeli DNA is pure. I, I'm going to post a screenshot. It's like insane. And I completely, like, I remember when my friend sent me that picture recently, just to remind me, I was like, fuck, I remember that happening. And somebody actually, uh, a trans man who was in our group actually got kicked out of that presentation because they were like, boo, this sucks. Like, this is fucked up. And at the time, again, I was so ignorant to everything that was going on. I didn't understand the extent of Israel's occupation until after October 7th. That's my own ignorance. I think a lot of people are in a, a similar boat, which is fine. Like it, sometimes it takes time to learn, but here we are. 
I don't even know why, like Iggy Azalea, everyone knows that's my, one of my toxic traits <laughs> is I listen to Iggy Azalea's music. When I win, when I win, I win, no win, I win, they good like she got hoes on call. Got hoes on call to come through, take a protocol, just damage it, that's my protocol. This many Australians don't slow, send no camera, I don't care who you want, no kill me, I gotta give it to you. She retweeted some shit recently that was like, um, I stay out of things that I don't know about. And it was like referencing the genocide that's happening to Palestinians. And it's like, girl, you've had at least a year to understand or to try to understand what is going on. And if you're just willfully ignorant at this point, I just don't have time for that shit. Israel and Lebanon. So Israel has invaded Lebanon six times before. The interesting thing here is they're using the exact same playbook that they used in Gaza. So they're, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister is saying that civilians are storing missiles in their kitchens and they never have proof. So even in Gaza, they didn't have proof of this. It was digitally rendered like 3D animation software that shows missiles, like someone's kitchen opening up and then a missile pointing out of it. And I don't know if you've seen footage of the missiles that uh, Iran has fired or Lebanon has fired on Israel, but like they're fucking huge. And if you really think that civilians have the infrastructure to store all of these missiles in civilian homes casually without like, it just like none of it adds up. And this playbook is, is exactly what is used in Gaza. And I think if you listen to all of the rhetoric that Israel has for Palestinians that they now have for, for Lebanon and Iran, so many of their military heads say things like, we are the light, we are fighting darkness, which is racist. They say things like, everyone is a terrorist. So when the babies are born, they're teaching them to kill. Therefore, they all have to be destroyed because they're all terrorists. To me, it showcases that there's no regard for civilian life. They want you to believe that everyone who is not Israeli, whatever that means, because a lot of people from Israel or who currently preside in Israel who are occupying the land, are actually European Jews and have come from Poland and other places in, in that region. But the last thing I'll say about the Lebanon situation is I think it's really interesting that statistics show that Israel is the aggressor 85% of the time. There's a, there's a chart online that shows like every time there was uh, an attack on Lebanon, most of the time Israel is attacking first. And I want to highlight a, a statement that Tim Walls just made at the VP debate, which I didn't even know that there was a VP debate. I'm pretty up on news and what's happening in the world. And I literally had no, I hadn't seen or heard anything about a VP debate. I don't know if that was by design or if I truly just overlooked that information in that news. I didn't even watch it. I just watched clips of it. So Tim Walls said, the expansion of Israel and its proxies is an absolute <laughs> fundamental uh, necessity for the United States to have the steady leadership there. Classifying everyone else in the region who isn't is Israeli as terrorists is an easy way to clear out the region, whether or not it's unjustified. I know Al Jazeera just released over an hour long documentary of all of the war crimes that Israel has committed. Go watch it. I'm gonna probably watch it later today or this weekend. Come up with your own conclusions. I don't think it's as complicated as people like to say it is. I think that that is a really good gaslighting tactic. It's a Zionist tactic to convince you that dehumanizing and killing millions of people over the last decade is justified when it isn't. And then the last thing I'll say about Lebanon before I keep moving on uh, other political news is in these recent strikes on Israel, they strike military bases. They do that to prevent Israel's military from shooting innocent civilians. And I think it's really, really, to me, it's really, 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 really telling that Israel classifies everyone else as a terrorist. So they're just indiscriminately bombing everything and everywhere, killing civilians, killing babies and saying, oh, well, you should blame the terrorists because they put all of their missiles in the civilian, in civilian homes. Meanwhile, Lebanon, Iran, all of these places, if they retaliate or if they fight back, they're blowing up air force bases and military bases to prevent them from further bombardment and invasion of their countries. So again, make your own conclusion. I'm sure there are people watching or listening that are like appalled that I would ever even remotely consider siding with Iran. Again, I don't know all of the complexities of the region, but like all I have is what's in front of me currently. And to me, if Israel has all the technology and all of the awareness of where these supposed terrorists are, you could do a ground invasion and find the terrorists and go inside the tunnels 
that exist, I'm doing tunnels and air quotes, pull out the people that you need, you don't need to destroy, I don't know how much, I don't know the percentage of Gaza that is now destroyed. I think I already saw as of, I don't know how long Israel has been bombarding Lebanon, but it's only been like two weeks and there's already 2,000 injured and like 1,000 killed. We're already at World, World War III, babes. Israel also just blew up a Russian military base. So they're trying to bring everyone in and it's just gonna be bat shit show and we're gonna have to pay for it with our tax dollars. So <laughs> hope you're ready. I wanna talk about Chapel Roan for a second. Now I don't listen to Chapel's music at all. It's just not really my vibe. Like maybe I'm like, I'm not trying to discredit her style or her, her talent, but I just, I don't really listen to to Caucasian music like that. But bless her because she has taken a stand. So she, in a nutshell, said that yes, Trump and Republicans are bad, but Democrats have done a lot of bad shit as well. And she is primarily referencing us giving money and military aid to Israel. What does Kamala say every time? Is it unwavering? She's like, I give unwavering support for Israel and their right to defend themselves. And I don't know if you saw this, but on October 7th, Hamas brutally women. And might I just say, do some Google searching. Those claims were debunked so many times about babies. And I think it's really telling that Democrats continue to use that phrasing and use that as justification. Do your own research. And by research, I don't mean get on Facebook. Some, Twitter actually for me has been a really solid source of news, which is funny considering Elon Musk is trying to like silence everyone because he's a fascist. Go on Twitter, search some keywords. Obviously they need to link to articles. Don't just look at tweets. In fact, the only, not the only, but like the most prominent instances of are occurring by the Israeli defense forces. I call them the Israeli occupation force or the IOF where there was video evidence of an IOF soldier a Palestinian man that they were claiming was a terrorist. And then people in Israel were protesting for that soldier's right to do that because as a terrorist, he doesn't deserve dignity and or doesn't deserve the right to not look it up. It's insane. So Chapel Ron basically said, she didn't get that in depth. Obviously, like I said, I'm very, um, I like to be wordy with my thoughts. Chapel Ron essentially said that yes, Republicans are bad, but Democrats are bad too. And she got all this backlash online suggesting that, well, she's just a Republican. It's basically the same narrative. Oh, there's a little gecko. There was a gecko in my house for two days and I tried to capture it and it ran away and I was really scared, but I just pushed it outside. Oh my God, if that big ass spider kills it, I'm gonna scream. <gasps> okay, I can't watch. Okay, so she was getting backlash and people were saying basically, Chapel, well, you're just a Republican then. You're just gonna give votes to Trump with that attitude. And it's the same attitude that people give me for voting for Joe, like you're wasting your vote, blah, 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 blah. And I just wanted to commend her because it really, and this is gonna piss some of you off, but like when you think of MAGA Republicans and how unwavering they are for someone like Donald Trump, who has been convicted of 30 something felonies, who wants to grab women by the pussy, who wanted to put innocent black men in jail. The Lincoln is a, I forget the, the name of it, the Lincoln Park Five or something five. Put uh, innocent black men in jail for some, like something they didn't do. For MAGA Republicans to unwaveringly support someone like that because they quote unquote like his policy positions. I don't understand how Democrats, I'm gonna call them like blue MAGA, which is basically like every fucking leftist who's voting or Kamala, everyone who went to the DNC and got their fucking nut because they were like, oh, this is so patriotic. and. Awesome. Even people who are just trying to vote for the lesser of two evils, I think you can't separate those blue Democrats from mega Republicans. If genocide isn't your red flag for Democrats and racism isn't Republicans red flag for Trump and Republicans, is one worse than the other? Is racism worse than complete disregard for human life? Not only disregard for human life by murdering innocent people overseas, but and funding it, giving billions of dollars at the expense of American citizens who just went through a hurricane, who are homeless, black folks and reparations, healthcare. Like there's so much in this country that we don't have. And while I think people say, well, like the defense budget is, is a different pot of money. Well, I don't know who the fuck in finance can figure out the budget to reallocate billions of dollars from our military to citizens in the United States. Someone needs to, someone can figure that out. And for Chapel Roan to acknowledge that both sides are bad, considering her platform, I think is a huge win for us as a society, but also just a huge win for like Hollywood in the pop world, uh, because I think a lot of Hollywood and a lot of the industry is run by 
Zionist. Uh, I mean, I'll speak, I'll speak about Amanda Seals often because she is out. She left Instagram. She's over on Patreon doing her thing. I love watching Amanda Seals. She has been unwavering in her support for liberation and abolition and Palestinians. She basically got blacklisted from Hollywood. So I think a part of it is she got blacklisted by Zionists. Her agents dropped her. She was trying to go back on her comedy tour, but so many comedy, so many theaters and comedy venues are run by Zionists. I tried to look for some black owned theaters in Atlanta because Amanda was asking folks like, hey, I wanna do this one woman show and where can I go? So I started looking up theaters in Atlanta and literally the first one I looked at was a black, I was like black owned theater Atlanta, click on it. I'm scrolling through the, the list of, of employees and the entire list, with, they were all black, except for the person at the top who, you know, he's like, I don't know if it's a venture capital firm or somebody who owns the theater, whatever. And so I go to look for him on Twitter and what's on his Twitter? A bunch of like October 7th, bring them home, release the hostages, referring to Israeli hostages. It like makes me feel fucking crazy that that's so real. And when this all first started happening, I had told my friend when all this happening as in like October 7th and like the recent bombardment on Gaza, I like sent him a long voice note. It was like 10 minutes because we were going back and forth. He's Jewish. I actually met him in Israel on the birthright trip. We've been friends this whole time. He would always combat things I had to say. He's like, I'm not a Zionist, but like, you just gotta be mindful. I told him follow the money as in like, I know that Gaza, has like Palestine has a bunch of oil reserves and it's clear as day that what Israel is doing is like a land grab. And so I said, follow the money at one point in that 10 minute long voice note that I sent him. And when he responded, the thing that he had the most concern or the most, he paid the most attention to what I said was like, oh, well you can't say follow the money because that is anti-Semitic because it implies that all Jews have money or like want money. And I was just like, this is not like, this brainwashing is so, fucking deep and it blows my mind. I mean, I'm assuming if you're listening to this, you know what Zionism is. I should define Zionism. So Zionism is essentially the idea that Israel is owed due to like 3000 year old idea of religious scripture that Israel is owned a certain amount of land mass. And as a result, they have superiority over everyone, everything else in the region, including displacement, murder, illegal sediments to take that land and that it is owed to them. That is what Zionism is. So as a Jewish person myself, I am anti-Zionist. Not all Jews are Zionists. So we need to make that distinction. Um, Zionism to me is a form of terrorism and displacing other innocent people. Uh, Columbia, I think, is one of the universities recently who, if you use the word Zionism or call somebody a Zionist, you are going to be considered, uh, like it's considered hate speech. Like you might get kicked out of campus, you might get kicked off school. And to me, again, all of this is the machine of how deep Zionist has roots into media, entertainment, education. And I wish that I was more organized in the sense that like, I have found all of this information myself by like, I mean, a lot of it's on Twitter that leads to a news article that leads to a documentary. And like, again, everyone needs to learn for, their self, for, learn for themselves, but it's really easy to find this stuff. And I hope in the future, I can do a better job of saving articles and things to link in the description so you all can have access to the same things that I have access to. Cause I don't wanna just be one of these people who sits on a podcast and spews bullshit without any justification, but like, Everything that I have mentioned is and has been well documented by Al Jazeera or The Guardian or some other like reputable news source with video as evidence or like with journalistic integrity. So I just wanted to say that I'm not just a talking head. Whoever you're listening to or whatever you decide for yourself, um, do your research doesn't mean like you hear it once or you see someone on Facebook that you respect post it because I think it's confirmation bias where like, if you think something is right or wrong, your brain is gonna like, your, your brain is gonna like allow you to do the things that convince you it's right or wrong, regardless of facts or evidence. I think that's confirmation bias in a nutshell. Woo, I went down a rabbit hole, bitch. So Chapel Roan, full respect. Amanda Seals, full respect. Macklemore is another person, full respect, who is like unequivocal and unwavering in their support for human rights and Palestinian rights and whose career has likely taken some hits as a result. Um, I think it's fabulous. I, I, I like don't care about celebrities anymore. 
after living in Los Angeles, I've interviewed a ton. I was writing for a black owned publication when I first moved to LA in 2018. And I've interviewed like four, three or four celebrities before I was like, you know what, this isn't for me because a lot of the conversations were just vapid or fake or they only scratched the surface. Their PR person would like unmute themselves if we were on a phone call and say, oh, let's not talk about that. And I just like, I don't have time for fake shit. Be vulnerable, be unwavering in your support for human rights. And if you're not, just like, get the fuck out. I don't have time for you. And I don't have time for you in what I consume media wise. And I also don't have time for that shit in my circle. So fuck off. Damn, I really get on some shit. So I wanna highlight that Bisan Auda, uh, won an Emmy. So Bissan, hello, this is Bissan from Gaza, if you recognize that. She is a 27-year-old who's been documenting Israeli's bombardment, uh, Israel's bombardment of Palestine, I mean, since October 7th, but she's also been a part of the movement for, for many years before. She just won an Emmy for her documenting the genocide and bombardment by Israel in Gaza. And the interesting thing is, so prior to the announcement of her win, over 150 Zionist celebrities and entertainment gatekeepers signed a letter under a nonprofit called Creative Community for Peace. They signed a letter to the Academy, the Emmy Academy, basically saying that Bissan has previous ties to a quote unquote terrorist organization and that her nomination should be rescinded. Uh, the terrorist organization, it's a Palestinian liberation organization, which again, uh, you really have to think about uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, Palestinian Liberation Front, like why all of these things exist. And I'm not going to do a deep dive on, on that, but I'll say it's obvious who the United States and other white genocidal colonizer nations, who they call a terrorist versus not. This country, the United States, was founded by murdering and slaughtering all of the native, all of the indigenous people and now we would be quick to call them terrorists if they asked or tried to get their land back. And the same goes for Hezbollah, it goes for Hamas, like these quote unquote, like if you actually look what other nations consider Hamas and Hezbollah terrorist organizations versus not, it's very obvious that like white colonizers call them terrorists when they try to fight back and protect their livelihood and their land and their people. And yeah, you can, there's a, there's a ton of, of UN, like I think it's the UN where they vote on this stuff or they, you know, you can you can see who, which countries designate terrorists and who don't. But um, I just think that that's an interesting point. So this letter from this nonprofit said that Bassan was connected to terrorist organizations in the past. So the president of the academy, Adam Sharp, so I'm gonna read about like a third of what he said because it's kind of long, but uh, Adam Sharp, the CEO and president of the academy, the Emmy Academy said, it's Bissan from Gaza and I'm Still Alive was reviewed by two successive panels of independent judges, including senior editorial leadership from each significant US broadcast news network. It was selected for nomination from among more than 50 submissions in one of the year's most competitive categories. The Academy is aware of reports cited in your letter and initially surfaced by a communications consultant in the region that appear to show a then teenage Bissan speaking at various uh, Palestinian Liberation Front events between six and nine years ago. The Academy has been unable to corroborate these reports, nor has it been able to date to surface any evidence of more contemporary or active involvement by Bassan with this organization. Most critically, the content submitted for award consideration was consistent with competition rules and the Academy's policies. Accordingly, the Academy has found no grounds to date upon which to overturn the editorial judgment of the independent journalist who reviewed the material. It's such a win for human rights, for Palestinian rights, for anti-Zionism. I was really shocked because even though it was 150 Zionists who are in the Hollywood war machine of Israel, the Zionist war machine, like I would suspect that the Academy also has ties there. So I was really just impressed that the CEO stood firm in like allowing her to stay, allowing Bassan to stay in the category. So uh, the some of the Zionists who signed this baseless attack against Bassan were Haim Saban. So like the CEO of Saban Capital Group, I believe that's the same company that's like Saban is, Saban made like the Power Ranger TV show. Uh, David Draymond, which is the front man of Disturbed. Like who the fuck are you? Deborah Messing, Will and Grace, we know her. The president of Fox Entertainment, 
a partner in three arts entertainment, when you, when you realize how deep it actually is, it's just so fucked up. But anyway, Bassan got her Emmy, so proud of her. And it's really dark that she got her Emmy uh, for documenting a genocide and that despite the win and the documentation, it's still allowed to continue. Really fucked up to me. The next thing I wanna talk about, you know, black people in politics, man, I'm, so Jill Stein and Butch Ware were on The Breakfast Club, which to me, having that exposure to black folks is such a huge win because like some homie knocked on the door, he was with, I forget what organization he was with, but he's like, yo, I'm doing a survey, I've got two questions. What is one, this was like two days ago, he was like, what is one issue in our nation that is most, affects you the most? And I said, uh, the fact that our money is sent overseas to murder innocent civilians. And he was like, who are you voting for in this election? And I said, Jill Stein. And he was like, he gave me a look, a confused look. And I go, she's a third party candidate. He goes, okay, other. So the fact that this, I forget the name of the organization. Like, I'm pretty sure it's like a reputable nonprofit. And they're just surveying people in the neighborhood to understand what people are doing. But the fact that like that organization on their questionnaire probably has like Donald Trump, Kamala Harris, other, like list the other, like the fact that whatever. Anyway, so Jill Stein and Butch were on The Breakfast Club. Angela Rye, I've never, I've never heard of her before. I went to her Instagram after that interview and a lot of people, I like she has like at least a hundred plus people that I know mutually who also follow her. She's like, uh, obviously as a black woman, like pro-black, um, she does a lot of like Democrat commentary on CNN and other Democrat news networks. But the way that she was going in on Jill in this interview, if you haven't watched the interview, it's a fabulous hour long at least, like definitely go watch it. But she basically spent the entire time trying to discredit the Green Party movement, particularly Jill Stein, saying that like she only shows up every four years, which isn't true. It's just not true at all. And she also was just trying to suggest that she is a loser. So Angela was like, well, you you basically, you keep running for president every four years. I think Jill took a break in 2020, but like, she's like, you run for president, you keep losing. Doesn't that make you a loser? Instead of trying to be, instead of trying to, so basically Angela's message during that interview was saying that we shouldn't try for something better than the two party system that we have because it's not gonna work. Meanwhile, as you heard earlier in this podcast from my survey, 25% of leftists who follow me are gonna vote for Jill Stein. And I suspect that that number has grown since that survey a month ago. So yeah, watch the interview. I just, so because Kamala is a black woman, black folks just like with Obama are like, yeah, we need to vote for the sister. And to me, a lot of people don't know this about Obama, but he was a warmonger as well. He bombed, like we bombed the fuck out of Afghanistan and all these other places under Obama's watch. And I wish I had known back then what I know now about like, what terrorism actually means and who, like who's fighting for land and resources versus who's fighting for their right to exist. I think there's completely different things. And for people who are just unwavering in their support for Kamala just because she's a black woman, I understand wanting to do that, but you also have to understand that white supremacy controls most of our two party system Capitalism is white supremacy. Donald Trump trying to take away body autonomy of women is white supremacy. Kamala and Joe and Tim Walls and Obama bombing innocent civilians overseas is white supremacy. And like, I just, and it's been, like another thing that got me too was uh, when Kamala went to Detroit, she all of a sudden gets a black scent and she's like, her, her inflection is different. She like literally has like a fucking black twang in how she speaks, which she never speaks that way at any other juncture unless she's like around or needs to pander to black people. And it's just so cringy and fake. And some people tried to say when I brought this up, oh, well, don't you know what code switching is? And code switching is essentially when somebody, typically a black person or a person of color, a marginalized person, changes their way of speaking or presenting out of safety in order to like fit the demographic that they need to, uh, with whom they need to interact. And I guess you could say that what Kam like Kamala gaining a black scent is code switching also. But if you feel like the only way you could be comfortable around your constituents, specifically your black constituents, is to change how you talk 99% of the time by like co-opting a black scent, Nothing screams fake ass bitch more than that to me personally. 
Speaking of black folks in politics, Eric Adams. Eric Adams was indicted. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Eric Adams is a quote unquote Democrat. He's been very pro-police. He's spent millions of dollars to send police in New York to stop and frisk and arrest violently people who jump the turnstiles of the subway in New York. He spent millions of dollars to do this when the amount of money that the MTA loses on fare evasion, it's significantly less. I think it's like a few hundred thousands of dollars. And recently somebody like, Recently, some cops shot a fair invader and also shot another police officer because of it. And like, yeah, he's uh, Eric Adams is like pro pro cop and he's always been this like weird power hungry cop sympathizer. Um, but he was just indicted. Yay. Uh, basically, he was getting undisclosed gifts from Turkey and other nations. Allegedly, he denies wrongdoing. He's even been like going to the church, the black church to be like, I'm innocent. Mm, they always try to do us wrong, which is the same thing a lot of niggas try to do. Not even niggas, just like the same thing that like Russell Brand now is a Christian and there was a picture of him in his tidy whities baptizing someone else next to another muscle bro wearing tidy whities It's just weird. It's weird how when people are accused of wrongdoing, all of a sudden they're like, oh, but God's got my back. It's like, nigga, you're a mess. We need to get Clarence Thomas next because Clarence Thomas has also accepted flights and gifts and things that would, in my opinion, or in the public's opinion, make him ineligible to remain like neutral to be on the fucking Supreme Court. But I haven't seen any movement with Clarence Thomas either. either. I don't know, child. So I'm glad that Eric Adams got what he deserved and that hopefully the city of New York can get somebody more progressive and not a cop sympathizing warmonger. But I'll also say this, it really like, I know this is just like me with my black lens on, but like it's frustrating to me that seemingly they can get the niggas quick. Like, oh, Clarence Thomas is doing this. Oh, let's indict Eric Adams. But it's like Trump has 34 fucking felonies and like he's going to run for president. And the, I think it was a federal judge who they keep postponing Trump's arraignment or his court date because they're like, well, let's just wait and see what happens until after the election. Like, how is that legal? Like you were, you were convicted, like do the shit now. Why? I mean, it's, it's again, that's why supremacy at play. But I'm not saying that like niggas whether it's political or fucking P. Diddy, like these people need to be held accountable. Again, I'm not for jail, so we need to figure out another system, but like for now, that's what it is. Like if we're gonna hold these people accountable, there's so many other people in politics and in the industry who are fucked up and who need to be held accountable. And I don't see that same, I don't see that same vigor, that same, that same attention paid to white people who are committing crimes. So I'm just gonna say that. Maybe that's just my perception, but like, that's what I'm getting from that. Trump was just at a rally child and he said that a violent day of policing will end crime. So Donald Trump, if he is elected, he basically wants to create a day where everyone can just go batshit crazy, commit crimes, do whatever they want. And Trump's suggestion is by having that day, Nobody will want to commit crimes anymore because it'll be so bad. People will be like, fuck this, we're never going back. I don't know if you've seen the movie, The Purge. That's literally the plot. Every day or one day a year, or one day every certain amount of time, I forget, I haven't seen the movie in a while. I think there were multiple, there were sequels of it. But everyone gets like 24 hours to commit any crime that they want to commit. And it's fucked up. Like, oh my God. The fact that like, I feel like I'm living in this, like we have to be living in a simulation. Like we are in the matrix. I am plugged in right now. The people who run the matrix are running these dumb programs and they're fucking with our head just to kind of see like what, like how we would react. And like, is, is this really like, I wake up every day and I'm just like, I can't believe someone decided that like capitalism and fucking white supremacy and war and working until you're until you're fucking 80 and not being able to spend time with your loved ones and with your family and reality tv and hollywood fucking losers having opinions and making the most money and deciding how working class people should exist. Oh my God, it's just like fucking insane. So yeah, Trump wants a purge and I think that that's wild. But also again, turning it back to Kamala and Biden with money and with billions in missiles and planes and bombs, etc. our country is funding a purge of Palestinians, of Iranians and other like, we have been doing this for decades. And I really, really need everyone to understand that like 
the the military industrial complex and the like police presence and the amount of police officers has only grown under Democrats and in Democrat places like Los Angeles, like New York, Atlanta, and they train with Israel's military and police. If you didn't know that, now you know. The change that we need has to happen because soon, you know, I think a lot of people just don't want to make a change to how they vote or their way of thinking until it like really affects them. I know this is fucked up to say, but like a lot of you bitches aren't gonna do anything until it actually comes for you. And child, it's it will come for you. You're seeing it happen across the world to brown people and you're like, oh, let's, we gotta just vote for the lesser of two evils because you know, I wanna keep my, my 401k and my single family home and like some tax breaks and all that stuff. Baby, that single family home and that electric car and that white picket fence ain't gonna save you. I think, uh, oh, actually I do have one more thing before I wrap is, uh, I thought this was interesting. So I feel like a big talking point for both the right and the left is what's happening at the border. I feel like all Kamala talks about is middle-class tax cuts and protecting the border and fentanyl and all this shit. And especially for Republicans, they're like, people are crossing our border and they're human trafficking fentanyl and it's affecting our children. Okay, again, I haven't really seen a lot of statistics that back up that claim, but what I do have actually a news article here. So on October 2nd in San Fernando Valley, California, 42 members of a white supremacist gang were federally indicted for drug trafficking, possession of illegal firearms, and COVID relief funds fraud. Not Haitians, not Mexicans, not drag queens. Hello? It was white supremacists. I follow this Twitter account and their sole purpose is to post pictures and mugshots of specifically police officers and pastors, people in the military who are uh, convicted of like child sex crimes. We're all in our own bubble of social media, right? Like, of course, something like that would come up in my algorithm of like condemning that type of people and showing that kind of stuff. But again, Oftentimes, like it's always religious people or cops or Republicans who try to condemn queer people and quote unquote liberals for grooming or for being thugs and destroying the integrity of our nation. To me, every accusation from that side is a confession. I'm gonna post it on screen and post a link to that Twitter account. I think everyone should see how prevalent religious leaders and police officers take part in drug and children trafficking because clearly we don't hear about that shit on CNN or Fox News and that's for a reason. Also, another interesting point to this is, uh, and I pulled this directly from the United States Sentencing Commission government website, 86.4% of convicted fentanyl traffickers are US citizens. So you can make the argument that the drugs are coming into our country from the border. I think a lot of people focus on Mexico and they don't even think about Canada because of course racism, why would they? But somebody, 86.4% of these drugs are being trafficked and moved around. Uh, and this is only convicted, right? These are the only people who are convicted and found are citizens of this country already. And I certainly don't hear Republicans or Democrats speaking to that. They're just like, but no, it's coming through our border and it's hurting our children, bitch. The Catholic preacher at your neighborhood church is a threat to your child. So think about that. I wrote this down, I didn't wanna read it verbatim, but maybe I will just for time. So uh, I don't want to tell you who to vote for or what to do. An old good friend of mine who recently came back into my life began arguing with me on Twitter about how Trump is going to be worse for this country, that we need to get Kamala in office first and then we can push her left, we need to start locally, etc. cetera. Uh, to me, the time to move slowly has run out. We have been advocating, like before Kamala's even elected, we have been trying to push her quote unquote more left and it hasn't happened, it hasn't happened. And so in my opinion, it's time to make a change now in any way possible. I don't think we need to be fragmented and segmented and wait, we'll start small and just like work our way up. No, we need liberation now. And the only way to do that is to break from this binary. So I'm going to break from the binary as quickly as I can in any method that I possibly can. I've been voting exclusively for Democrats my entire life. My rights or access to health, wealth and community has really only gotten worse. You can argue because I've worked my ass off and I'm like middle class comfortably, which I'm grateful for. Like maybe you're like, well, why the fuck are you talking about this? Like you have, you know, your privilege. So this doesn't apply to you. Um, 
I've worked for it. I've been a slave to capitalism for 20 fucking years. So much so that I put my passions like this aside to like make rich white men even more rich and to give them even more power to like take my rights away. I wanna get back to doing the things I love to do like community and public building. All of that has fallen by the wayside because I'm a slave to capitalism and this binary system that we live in. If So I've worked for 20 years straight. My first job, uh, I was 15, it was a fast food restaurant. I've worked for 20 years. If I quit my job today, I could live comfortably with like all of my expenses and my bills for maybe two years. If I wanted to be frugal, I could make it stretch. But the fact that I've been working nonstop and saving, and if I were to just like leave my job and not have a backup, that I would only be safe from homelessness for two years is like disgusting and mind boggling. Something is wrong. I want better for myself. I want better for everyone who's watching this. Even if you watching disagree with who I am or what my insights are, we deserve better. We just do. I'm not lazy by any means. Trust, I'm not fucking lazy. I'm tired. I'm absolutely fucking tired, but um, I'm not lazy. And I don't think anyone else is lazy too. We're all just fucking tired and we deserve better. I wanna, I wanna leave you with this. When you think of Democrats and Republicans, you think that Democrats and Kamala is on the left. You think that Trump is on the right. And then the center is like somewhere who straggles between the two. So. I think we need to really redefine what left, right, and center is. Here's what, to me, what the right stands for politically and ignore candidates. Let's just look at the political binary because that's what we're in right now. So the right is fascism, controlling our bodies, putting people in concentration camps, genocide, the 1% controls everything. Democracy is a farce to them. They don't think democracy works or they wanna control democracy or control our choices, criminalizing, making it so uh, in the prison industrial complex. So criminalizing things that maybe don't need to be criminalized and not trying to revamp a system because the prison industrial complex creates slaves and boosts capitalism. So to me, that's what the right is. Pause for reflection. The center, so I'm not gonna say, so everyone thinks that the left is like, uh, pro-LGBTQ and ending homelessness and blah, 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 blah. To me at this point, that is center. So the center to me is bare fucking minimum equality for everyone in this country. LGBTQIA 2S plus rights, the right to choose, the like autonomy over your own body. Everyone is fed, everyone has a roof over their head and the ethical production of good and services. Now saying that last piece is t difficult because in order to produce things, you have to extract, and it's really hard to produce things and extract without destroying the ecosystem or displacing people. But again, the bare minimum would be like doing everything you possibly can to create and promote and capitalize ethically, which again, to me, capitalism, to me, capitalism is like center still, center right, but like if you're gonna do it, do it ethically. And for me, the true left at this point is reparations and reversal of all the damage that the center and the right has done. So the left that you think is just like pro LGBTQ and like fucking cutting taxes, that's center to me. So the left to me is reparations and reversal. So giving black and indigenous people financial reparations, giving indigenous people land back in this country, scaling back and the fall of capitalism. That is the left. I will leave it to you on that note to decide which candidates fall, where they fall in that very binary line of, of political affiliation. But I think in order for us to move forward, we really have to consider what that means for us and for our nation. And I just wanted to point that out to you. All right, it feels really good to be back. I really get nervous to set, make my setup and to talk and to do all of these things. I just need to build, it's like I do this and I get worn out and then I do the editing and then I release it into the world and it takes me weeks, sometimes months to recover. I really wanna start making this my bread and butter. Like if I could do this full time, I'm gonna try to do this full time. There's, there's a lot of life changes happening soon. I'm not gonna talk about them here on this episode right now because there's like a whole, you, when you find out the shit that I've been through, you're gonna shit your pants, but it's also good. There's a lot of good happening for me and in my 
outlook on the future and my my passions like reinvigorating. So like I said, I really appreciate your commitment to to me and like your trust in me. Subscribe to Queers and Steers podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Queers and Steers. Please subscribe. It really helps out the channel and helps me grow so I can do this full time. Contact me. What do you want to hear about next? Do you want to hear about tech? Do you want to hear about pop culture? Email me editor at the set standard. That's editor at T H E S E T S T A N D A R D dot com. Or find me on Instagram, call me fag, C A L L M E F A G. DM me. Let's chat. I can't wait for the next episode. I really appreciate you all. I hope you're staying safe and healthy, and I'll talk to you soon. Peace.